hey, it's Noel, and this is the next to last episode of season two of Lost Highways, and I wanted to ask you a quick favor. Whether you're a regular listener or new to the podcast, we'd be much obliged if you could take a minute to fill out our end of season survey. Just go to historycolorado.org forward slash podcast survey. It'll only take you a few minutes and you can help us make next season better. Again, that's historycolorado.org forward slash podcast survey. Thanks so much. Lost Highways from History Colorado is made possible by the Sturm Family Foundation, proud supporters of the humanities and the power of storytelling for more than 20 years. And by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, exploring the human endeavor. Hey, it's Tyler. As a heads up before we get started, this episode contains frank discussions of genitalia and gender. Please also note outdated terminology about transgender issues that some may find offensive are used in their historical context. I know it's in here somewhere because I don't throw things away. I keep them in my personal archive, which is one of the many drawers full of disorganized crap that I'm sure my kids will immediately throw in the garbage when I die. There it is. One of the little Sony MC90 micro cassettes I used to use to record my interviews when I was a newspaper journalist. The date is scratched out. April 7, 2004, the day I drove to Trinidad to meet Dr. Stanley Biber. Over the course of his career, he was one of the best known and most prolific gender confirmation surgeons in the world. His name is also scratched out. Written above it is simply ZX4. I have no idea what or who that was, but I hope I didn't dub over Dr. Biber, or at least not all of it. These cassettes were expensive and I'd reuse them when I didn't have a chance to get to the store. Sadly, there's nothing left but a really bad recording of ZX4, whoever that is. Dr. Biber is gone. Fourteen years after his death in 2006, Dr. Biber seems to have disappeared from memory in Trinidad, the town where he lived and practiced medicine for more than 40 years. There's no memorial, no plaque. I call the mayor's office and city council members, but never hear back. When I visited in 2004, everyone in town seemed to know and respect him. But now, on Main Street, no one seems to even recognize his name. Do you remember who, do you know who Stanley Biber was? Stanley Biber, no. No? Have you ever heard of who Stanley Biber was? Stanley Biber, no sir. Okay, thank you. From History Colorado Studios, this is Lost Highways. Dispatches from the Shadows of the Rocky Mountains. I'm Tyler Hill. And I'm Noel Black. On each episode, Tyler and I explore overlooked stories from our home state of Colorado and the American West. On this episode, how Trinidad, Colorado, an iconic western mining town along the old Santa Fe Trail on the New Mexico border, became the unlikely location for two pioneers of gender confirmation surgery. Their work would earn Trinidad the now-dated nickname, quote, the sex change capital of the world and how those doctors began to transform the ideal of freedom in the American West to include expanded understandings of gender that continue to evolve to this day. From Caitlyn Jenner, Elliot Page, and Carmen Carrera on RuPaul's Drag Race, to Laverne Cox from Orange is the New Black, Hunter Schaefer from the HBO series Euphoria, and Brian Michael Smith on Queen Sugar. Complex transgender people and characters are more visible in American pop culture than ever before. But however new the current visibility of trans people and the use of non-binary pronouns may seem, transgender and gender non-conforming people have always existed in every culture. Here's Eric Plemons. He's associate professor in the School of Anthropology and director of the Medical Anthropology Program at the University of Arizona. Transgender and transsexual are fairly new words, but we can look back to the historical record across time and place and see that there have always been people who somehow fit outside of whatever the gender structure of their society was. And there are many examples from countries and cultures far older than the United States. But look at India, or but look at Thailand, or but look at all these places, or but look at ancient Greece. 
there have always been such people. East Indian Hindu culture, for example, recognizes the Kanar as they refer to themselves. They're considered a third gender, and references to them date back as far as 400 BCE. Long before colonists arrived, many indigenous tribes in North and South America also recognized what are now broadly called two spirits. And despite the widespread myths about what we now call the American West being the domain of gender conforming explorers and settlers, gender non conforming people also played a major role, says Peter Bogue. Bogue is professor of history at Washington State University on the Vancouver campus and author of the 2011 book, Redressing the American Frontier. In it, he argues, quote, cross-dressers were not merely ubiquitous, but were very much part of daily life on the frontier and in the West. I use the term cross-dresser, which is a very problematic term, and I tried to explain the problems with that in my introduction. Uh, many of the people I would be comfortable calling transgender, but then there were also many people that were simply what you would call cross-dressers who dressed in clothing that was not socially accepted as being of their sex for any number of mundane reasons. As Bogue mentioned, crossdresser can be a problematic term if it's used to describe someone who's actually transgender. What he's saying is that in the so-called Wild West, people wore non-gender conforming clothes all the time. This was sometimes done for reasons having nothing to do with being trans, but in many cases it did. If you're wondering what the difference is between gender and sex, you're not alone. To put it simply, gender and sex are not the same, but sometimes they line up. Gender is socially constructed. It's a set of expectations that society has for how one behaves, what clothes you wear, etc. Sex is also complicated. It's more than genitals and chromosomes, but doctors tend to take one look at a person's genitals at birth and assume they know their gender. Except sometimes you're assigned a gender at birth that isn't exactly who you are. And what if, after learning about who you are, you decide maybe there are steps you want to take, and maybe one of those steps is gender confirmation surgery. But where do you go? Or, better yet, where could you go? This episode deals largely with the history of a part of the transgender community that elects gender confirmation surgery as part of their transition. Throughout the episode, you'll also hear the term bottom surgery. However, the point of surgery isn't its location on the body, but the positive effect it has on the person's life. And having surgery isn't a requirement for being trans. In fact, there is no single criteria for being trans. The process of transition is often completely different for each person. In his search for gender non-conforming people in the American West, Peter Bogue scoured all kinds of historic documents, from county history books to old census reports, microfilm, and especially digitalized historical newspapers from around the country. The stories often followed a similar arc. A person wearing clothes not conforming to their gender assigned at birth, and long believed to be the gender indicated by the clothing they wore, would get arrested for some reason, or have to get medical attention. Then, once their clothes were off, the mismatch of the individual's gender presentation and their sex assigned at birth would be revealed to varying degrees of shock and disbelief. This was often a terrifying and potentially dangerous experience for them. And these types of reactions to being outed are still a huge concern for trans people today. Bogue says that once they were unclothed, it would often get reported in a local newspaper and get picked up by larger city papers. One of the stories Bogue came across in his research of gender non-conforming characters in the early American West was surprisingly unsensationalized and humane in its treatment for the time. It appeared in Trinidad, Colorado's Daily Advertiser on November 12, 1907. It was about a local man named Charles Vosbaugh. Charles Vosbaugh was a, a person, a trans person, assigned a female sex at birth. Vosbaugh moved around the United States and ultimately made his way out west. He arrived in Trinidad with his wife and worked as a ranch hand and a sheep herder. In 1905, at the age of 81, he fell ill and checked himself in to the Mount San Rafael Hospital, which was run by Catholic nuns. And it was discovered while he was in the hospital that he had the sex of a woman. But what is really nice about this story is that really well accepted into his community. People had known him for many years, and also the nuns called him Grandpa. 
After a two-year hospitalization, Charles Vosbaugh died on November 12th, 1907. Wait, is this, when did he die? He died in 1907. It's a warmish gray day after a snowstorm in the Catholic cemetery on the northeast no. end of Trinidad. Should I start looking? Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm try looking for Charles Vosbaugh's grave in an older section of oh, headstones okay. that date back to the late 1800s and early 1900s. Many of the names are Italian or Irish. Some of them miners and their families, no doubt, who immigrated to the U.S. and came west to work under the mountains, breathe coal dust, and die here. Let's see. Josephine Dolce, Luigi Costa, Frank Ruffini. After searching for almost an hour, I can't find it. Well... I don't know. So we drive across town to the Masonic Cemetery, where the big Trinidad sign, like the Hollywood sign, sits on top of the bluff called Simpson's Rest. Inside the Masonic Cemetery, there's a small Jewish subsection. Congregation Heron, that's gotta be it. Almost a hundred years after Charles Vosbaugh was buried here in Trinidad, Dr. Stanley Biber was buried in the Jewish Cemetery just across town. It's odd, I think, that Biber might never have even heard of Vosbaugh. Oh, where? Oh, there it is. It's interesting that it doesn't say anything about his life or anything. It's just, that's it. Over the course of his life, working out of the same Mount San Rafael hospital where Vosbaugh died, Stanley Biber would become synonymous with gender confirmation surgery and earn Trinidad its illustrious nickname. And 15 years after his death, this gravestone, like Vosbaugh's, wherever it is, is the only memorial to Dr. Stanley Biber in the entire town. Born on May 4, 1923, Stanley Biber grew up in Des Moines, Iowa. His father was a carpenter, and his mother helped other Jewish people immigrating to the United States find work and resettle. His one sister, Terry, died at age 13 of an autoimmune disease. That left Stanley to carry the hopes of his parents, says Mary Lee Biber, his widow and fifth wife. And after that, he said it was kind of hard in the house because his mom never got over that. And she always wanted him to be a rabbi. And he tried being a rabbi. He really did. Biber was also a gifted piano player, and his parents thought he might become a concert pianist. And then World War uh, II happened, and he went and joined the military. And he was uh, stationed on uh, peninsula of Alaska and uh, Russia. The war and the Holocaust shook Biber. And then after that, he told her that he couldn't become a rabbi. He had to become a doctor after seeing everything in, the, in what went on with the war. And so uh, he did. He became a doctor. After completing his medical training, Biber went back to war, this time in Korea, where he served in a mobile army surgical hospital unit. He grew up uh, as a surgeon in Korea during the Korean War in a MASH unit. Got very skilled at doing microsurgeries, you know, um, uh, to lower body extremities because of landmine injuries and that sort of thing. This is Martin Smith, a journalist and author of the forthcoming book Going to Trinidad, a doctor, a Colorado town, and stories from an unlikely gender crossroads. Smith says that performing surgery on the front lines day in and day out gave Biber the confidence not only that he could save lives, but that he could fix almost anything on the human body under the most extreme circumstances. There was a, a story out of Korea that he had done 37 surgeries back to back during a particularly bloody siege you know, going on in, during the Korean War. Um, and um, at one point, something exploded outside the surgical tent and some shrapnel lodged in his butt. Uh, and there was blood running down his leg as he was doing these surgeries. You know, those are not ideal conditions for a surgeon. Um, but I think coming out of that experience, he was particularly confident in himself and his abilities. Shortly after he came back from the war, Colorado Fuel and Iron offered Biber a one-year contract to care for their miners in Trinidad. Being a country doctor and the town's only surgeon suited Biber. Along with his talent for piano, his early rabbinical training, and his skills as a surgeon— Biber had long nursed a fantasy of being a rancher, and land around Trinidad was cheap. He could also perform almost any surgical procedure, 
and those he hadn't performed before, he'd teach himself. I remember one time he had to do a difficult surgery. He sat at the kitchen table and had this book out and read for about two and a half hours, and he closed the book and he says, okay, I can do that. And he did it the next day. He opened an office on the fourth floor of the First National Bank building, the closest thing to a skyscraper in downtown Trinidad, and tended to the medical needs of the community. So he set everybody's broken bones, he delivered babies, he did appendectomies. If you got shot or stabbed, Stanley Biber was the guy that stitched you up. And in that role, he knew everybody in Los Animas County. When he wasn't tending to his patients or his cattle, he was playing piano or lifting weights. Yes, he was also an avid weightlifter and almost made the Olympic team while he was in college. And when there was no rabbi available at Temple Aaron, the local synagogue, Biber would also perform services for the small Jewish community in and around Trinidad. Yet even with his remarkable talents and his well-developed professional ego, Biber maintained a decidedly modest outward appearance. A bowling ball with glasses? Balding head with a comb over of hair, a uh, little punch. I think it was 5'7", not very big, smiled, always had a smile. He wore a hat, cowboy boots, and just, he never taunted his profession. With the possible exception of his love of cowboy outfits, there was nothing flashy about Biber. In fact, says Martin Smith. He was apparently the cheapest guy on the planet, in an endearing sort of way. Most notoriously, Biber drove the same little beat-up Toyota pickup truck around town for longer than anyone cared to guess. That was his, his daily ride. He'd show up for lunches, he'd show up for business meetings in it often. It, it ended up being passed down among his many children uh, over the years, but that was him. That was, he was a very unpretentious man. Many of these characteristics may seem somewhat superficial to note, but it was precisely Stanley Biber's unpretentious outward manner, his love of rural Western life, and his ability to care for others that won him the respect and admiration of almost everyone in the community. And he would need every ounce of that community goodwill when a friend walked into his office and asked if he could perform a surgery that would change both of their lives. By the end of the 1950s, the coal mines around Trinidad, which had driven the economy for the past 75 years, began to close. Many of the diverse workers and their descendants whose families had come from all over Europe to work in the mines moved away. There was a brief flurry of media attention in the mid-1960s when the artists and hippies of the Drop City Commune just north of town built their colorful geodesic domes. But Trinidad was in search of a new identity and an economy to go with it. Then, one day in 1969, Stanley Biber was in his Spartan fourth-floor office behind his gray metal desk in the First National Bank building waiting to meet with a friend. Here's Martin Smith. One of his friends was a social worker. He worked with this social worker on cleft palate cases in the county. He would do, you know, try to repair cleft palates in children. Um, and this social worker had come in and for a meeting about a cleft palate case. And they were sitting in his office and she said, you know, once the business of the day was done, she said, um, I have a question for you. Would you consider doing my surgery? And as Biber tells the story, he said, sure, you know, what you got? He was, he was a cocky, mash-trained surgeon. He could do anything, um, didn't, didn't uh, have any ab lack of ego. Uh, sure, I can do your surgery. What do you want me to do? And she said, well, I'm a transsexual. And, he, and he, his first reaction was, what's that? You know, he knew about Christine Jorgensen. He understood somewhat about it. But he didn't really understand, you know, the surgical process of transforming male genitalia into female genitalia. Though few outside the LGBT community remember her name now, Christine Jorgensen became an overnight celebrity after she returned to the United States from gender confirmation surgery performed by a doctor in Denmark in 1951. In many ways, the media fascination that followed Jorgensen in the 1950s wasn't all that different from the fame Caitlyn Jenner found when she came out in 2015. A 26-year-old ex-GI arrives home from Denmark where doctors converted him into a woman. Two years ago, the name was George Jorgensen. Today, it's Christine. Have you been offered a movie contract? Yes, but I haven't accepted it. Do you, uh, do you have any plans regarding the theater? No, I don't think so. And Christine! Uh, are you going to go on with your photography? I hope so, yes. 
I see. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't have any plans at the moment. And I thank you all for coming. But I think it's too much. Fine. Thank you very much. Her picture was on the cover of the New York Daily News the next day with the headline, XGI Becomes Blonde Beauty. Jorgensen embraced her overnight celebrity, doing newspaper and TV interviews, Hollywood cameos, and performances on stage. Here's Eric Plemons from the University of Arizona again. Christine Jorgensen certainly was not the first person to undergo those procedures, but she was the first person who entered the mainstream. And as a result of the, the publicity that she, that she produced, or the, the sort of public fascination of what had happened to her, a lot of the folks, the medical care providers, who had been sort of quietly um, aiding trans people, who again, at that moment, the transsexual was not a word that existed. Um, so aiding folks who are interested in changing their, their secondary sex characteristics, they became more well-known, um, more accessible because of her publicity. It's important to note here that there's a big difference between the long and varied history of transgender expression throughout the world and the much more recent history of the medicalization of gender that led to modern gender confirmation surgery. Hi, my name is Susan Stryker, and I am Professor Emerita of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Arizona, and currently the Barbara Lee Distinguished Chair in Women's Leadership at Mills College in Oakland, California. Stryker says that even though transgender medical history is just a fraction of transgender history, that it still goes much further back than most people realize, certainly much further than Christine Jorgensen. The first recorded vaginoplasty is the surgical construction of a vagina actually dates to the 1760s. You know, it's like it's really old. You know, it was performed on somebody who um, had a medical condition called congenital avaginosis, which is basically like, you know, people who are, you know, so-called biologically female in terms of their reproductive anatomy um, are born without um, a vaginal opening and that um, um, the first time surgeons constructed, um, you know, an an outlet where, you know, um, um, you know, to to allow sperm to reach, you know, the os and for any baby that happened to develop in the womb to have a, a, a way to get out. The investigation of the effects of sexual hormones, says Stryker, began not long after that. In the 1770s, that you started to see the first medical experiments for doing um, gonad transplants on animals, you know, where they were figuring figuring out things like, oh, if you put um, a rooster's testes in a hen, it will grow a coxcomb. Roughly another 50 years later, in the early 18th century, surgeons began to perform cosmetic surgeries on what were then considered atypical genitals. People born intersex, with sexual characteristics that fall outside binary categories of male and female, for example. But by the, like the late 19th century and early 20th century, you were starting to see you know, what I would call like the discourse of transsexuality kind of cohering, of this sort of set of beliefs where like, people believed that a doctor could diagnose somebody with some psychopathology, you know, some gender inversion syndrome of some kind and refer them to surgeons and endocrinologists who could change their genitals and their secondary sex characteristics and then have, on the basis of those medical procedures, be legally recognized as a member of the gender they were not assigned to at birth. Um, and to have their name and gender sort of you know, legally recognized, name change, you know, et cetera, et cetera. By the mid-20th century, when Christine Jorgensen became the most publicly visible trans person in the world, a set of common practices that combined surgical techniques, hormones, and psychological evaluation began to cohere. It was Christine Jorgensen's doctor who began to codify transgender protocols. Here's Eric Plemons again. The most famous one of those is um, Harry Benjamin who was um, a German-born endocrinologist, and he became sort of the most important person in the scene overnight because all of a sudden his office uh, was flooded with letters from people all over the country um, who wanted the exact same thing that Christine had done. 
European doctors had far more progressive attitudes toward transgender care, and Harry Benjamin began developing practices based on the protocols of his German colleague Magnus Hirschfeld. Here's Susan Stryker. Hitler actually called Hirschfeld the most dangerous Jew in Germany. Uh, you know, he was a political activist for homosexual emancipation. Uh, he was a socialist. I mean, you know, it's like he was a very progressive, left-leaning kind of guy. And he was one of the, you know, the pioneers of um, affirmative um, care, medical care for trans people. Hirschfeld was targeted by the Nazis in 1933 when they shut down his Institute for Sexual Research and burned his books, forcing him into exile and setting his field of study back by years. But even after Christine Jorgensen's successful gender confirmation surgery in Denmark, there wasn't a whole lot of surgery happening in the United States um, in the early part or in the middle part of the 20th century, um, in part because the expertise hadn't really been developed yet. Um, and there was a real tension in the legal landscape about what kind of thing would be permitted legally to do. And so there was a lot of anxiety among clinicians about what they could do um, legally and safely. Um, and there was also, of course, a, a stigma against these folks who, um, you know, it was until 1955 that, that or 54, 55, that transsexual was first um, suggested as a term. And mostly it was suggested around the problem of, uh, you know, psychological pathology. And so there was a lot of stigma and many clinicians who might have been able to develop the skill or capacity to, to provide different types of surgical interventions weren't very comfortable doing it. But doctors abroad were performing the surgeries, and one of the most prominent was a French gynecological surgeon named Georges Barou, who had a practice in Casablanca. And some of the early American autobiographies of surgery really center around that trip to Casablanca. And there's a lot of this sort of exoticizing language about, you know, going to Morocco and, you know, this sort of walking through the bazaars and there's this surgeon who's going to change my life. Um, and uh, Baru is the one who invented basically the blueprint of the main form of vaginoplasty that's done today, which is called a penile inversion vaginoplasty. By the late 1960s, more than a dozen universities in the United States had established clinics with support from a wealthy transgender woman named Rita Erickson. Johns Hopkins and UCLA were the two most prominent, but only Johns Hopkins provided gender confirmation surgery. But for many transgender people who wanted to get into these programs in what became known as the university era, the bar was set too high. The demand was huge, says Eric Plemons, and the attitudes were paternalistic. And so the clinics were um, famously very judgmental. <laughs> they were very heteronormative. They often required, as you know, treatment at a university hospital always does, you get seen by lots and lots of people. They have a very low number of, you know, kind of turnout in terms of how many patients they would see. Many would be forced to undergo years of psychological evaluation before surgery would even be considered. It was around this time that Dr. Biber's social worker friend reached out to him to see if he could perform her surgery. Biber reached out to a doctor at Johns Hopkins who'd performed 12 or 13 vaginoplasty procedures and asked if they could provide him with more information. Here's journalist Martin Smith. That doctor sent him some hand drawings. Um, uh, in, in my book, I, I refer to them as, you know, uh, drawings that might have been done by a, a, an eight-year-old uh, who had some background in gynecology. Um, they, they were just hand drawings, you know, like you'd see on a refrigerator somewhere, um, of how to do these surgeries. And he, you know, Biber, again, cocksure, um, looked at it, you know, kind of said, well, yeah, I think I can do this. So he contacted the woman and said, I would be happy to do your surgery. Um, you know, I'm giving it, I'm going to give it a try if you're willing. And she said, yes. And so that's when it started. If you're enjoying this episode of Lost Highways, you may want to explore Trinidad's past and its place in the American West at the Trinidad History Museum. Featured exhibits such as Borderlands of Southern Colorado and the Santa Fe Trail Museum showcase the region's diverse cultural and ethnic heritage. The property features the historic Blue Mansion and Baca House, 
two residences built in the late 19th century, as well as Heritage Gardens, all on one block in Trinidad's acclaimed historic district. If you want to learn more about our eight museums throughout the state, go to historycolorado.org. In 2004, when I sat down for an interview with Dr. Biber, I asked him why he decided to perform his first gender confirmation surgeries. Though I dubbed over the tape, I still have a transcript of the interview. He said, You've got to realize that surgeons aren't very humble. They take a challenge. Surgery is like an artist playing the piano. You develop your depth of technique and things like that. And that's what makes it a challenge. How can I do it better? And that's what we did. So you weren't even thinking about what the actual surgery was, I said? Nah, he said. We didn't care about that. Then, later in the interview, when I pressed him about whether he performed the surgeries for something more than the challenge, he said, if I can do something for these people, I think it's worthwhile. Once Biber had successfully completed his friend's surgery, word began to spread in the trans community. Many trans people saw him as one of the very few doctors they could actually trust. And this kind of word-of-mouth recommendation is still one of the primary ways that trans people find healthcare providers who they know will make them feel safe and understood. Biber was suddenly offering a surgical procedure that was almost impossible to get without traveling abroad, and he was doing it without the red tape of the university clinics. To top it all off, Biber offered penile inversion vaginoplasty and other gender confirmation surgeries at a rate that most people could afford. I think it was $3,500 to do uh, the surgery. He kept it affordable. Unsure of what the administration and medical staff at the Catholic Mount San Rafael Hospital might think, Biber at first kept the surgeries discreet. He told his bosses that he, he was just doing accident cases. These people had had an unfortunate accident and he was doing repair work. As word got around that he could do this surgery, that he was willing to do this surgery, and that he treated his patients with great respect and, um, uh, you know, no judgment. There was no judgment involved. Word got around uh, in the worldwide transgender community um, uh, so that people who had made that difficult decision that I am going to have this surgery wanted to come somewhere where they didn't feel judged. If Biber was going to continue providing these procedures, he knew he had to figure out how to get the hospital and its staff behind him. He's a Jewish surgeon. He's operating in a Catholic hospital, and he's doing gender confirmation surgeries in 1969, Um, you know, way before the vast majority of people even understood what that was. His early cases, he kept the case files in the administrator's safe in his office because he really didn't want anybody to know what he was doing. But the hospital alone wouldn't be enough. Trinidad was a small town where news and gossip spread fast. He needed to get the entire town together to educate them and to rally their support. Here's Mary Lee Biber. He got to all the ministers in town, talked to all the priests in town, and went to the nuns and said, you know, this is what I want to do. And they kept it quiet for a long time at the hospital, him doing that. But once he went to the community as a whole, the community had no objections as far as I know. You know, everybody, you know, it brought money into town. You know, these people had to stay someplace. Their families came with them. They had to stay someplace. And so to them, I think the community thought it was okay. Nobody ever faulted him for it. Nobody ever said, you're doing the wrong thing. Uh, They always treated these people that stayed in Trinidad with respect. Trinidad was still, in many ways, the same town that 60 years earlier had treated Charles Vosba with such dignity. Before long, Biber was doing three to four procedures per week. Though most of the surgeries he did were penile inversion, vaginoplasties, he also began developing techniques for phalloplasty, constructing a penis from soft tissues. Phalloplasty is a much more difficult surgery to perform because there's less tissue to work with. As Susan Stryker says, Taking away is easier than building up, you know. From 1969 until he retired in the early 2000s, shortly before his death, Stanley Biber and Trinidad became practically synonymous with gender confirmation surgery. During that time, Biber performed approximately 6,000 procedures, 
all while continuing to serve as a general practitioner and surgeon for the rest of the Trinidad community. Trinidad became the destination of choice. The phrase going to Trinidad became a euphemism in the transgender community for going to have the surgery. I'm going to Trinidad, and everybody knew what that meant. Um, it was destination specific because that's where Biber was. The experience of going to Trinidad was undoubtedly different for each of Stanley Biber's roughly 6,000 patients. But for them, it was often the culmination of a much longer inward journey that marked the beginning of a new life. Anne Ogborn calls herself a Biber baby, class of 88, which was the year she got her confirmation surgery. Scared by the anti-trans rhetoric and policies of the Trump administration, she left the United States in 2018 and emigrated to the Netherlands, where I spoke to her via Zoom. There's basically two questions I don't answer. I don't answer, like, intrusive questions about my genitals, and I don't give out my dead name. Born in Salina, Kansas in the late 1950s, Anne had always known she was a girl. She didn't know the words gay, lesbian, or homosexual, and it wasn't about sex. The idea of being sexual to someone implies that you've got enough sort of personal energy left over to be doing that. And I was just trying to stay alive. I mean, it was a daily, just, am I going to live through another day, you know? Anne wasn't traditionally masculine. Most of the time she tried not to think about it and just go about her life. But even the boys at school who were effeminate thought she was too effeminate. It was so painful that you were better off not thinking about it. Some kid walked up to me in the hall one day at school and said, there are lots of us. Most of us aren't so obvious. Around that time, Anne came across an article in Time magazine at the school library about the transgender tennis player Renee Richards. She was profiled in a 2011 ESPN documentary called Renee. Hey, Bye, Renee Richards has become the source of international and national controversy over the past week or two. A cause celeb. The reason? Is she male or is she female? She is a transsexual. Two years ago, she was Dr. Richard Raskin and was ranked nationally among the top 20 male tennis players over age 35. It's just overpowering all the other stories. And how many transsexuals were in the world at the time? And it just so happens one of them is a professional tennis player. It's like, what are the odds, you know? I said to her, what do you call yourself? Transgender, transsexual? I'm a woman like everyone else. Ask me how the match went instead. You know, how in the world did this happen? This might be... Renee Richards was a tennis phenom before she began her transition with the help of Harry Benjamin in the early 1970s. After she transitioned, she famously sued the United States Tennis Association for requiring her to take a genetic test to prove her gender before competing. Though she eventually won the case, her tennis career never fully recovered. But for Anne, just seeing the word transsexual in print and seeing Renee Richards made her feel like she was staring into the mirror of her own soul. Overjoyed and relieved to have finally felt her experience named and validated, Anne then tried to talk to the only person she thought might be able to help her. In 1972, um, I attempted to come out. I went to a youth pastor and told him I was trans. And at the time, you know, that was an obscure thing, you know. And um, he didn't really know what to do to help me. And I was angry at the guy for not helping me for many years. And uh, then at some point I realized he couldn't. There was nothing he could do. After hitting that first dead end, Anne kept her truth to herself until she got to college, where she studied physics and computer science. While she was there, she started to come unraveled, and her behavior got out of control. Some friends suggested she get help. I was pretty screwed up, and eventually they sort of said, Annie, you need to get yourself straightened out. So that was a wake-up call. I started seeing a therapist, and, and then pretty soon after that, okay, I'm trans, I'm going to have to deal with that. After leaving the University of Kansas in the early 80s, she moved to Kansas City and found a community. Pretty soon, right after I got to Kansas City, one of the first things I did, um, there was a cross-dresser support group. 
I that wasn't a great support for somebody actually transitioning. So uh, I started another group, and there were six of us. You know, I put an ad in the paper, and I remember it was all pre-internet, and gathered six of us together, and that kind of was the group. And uh, one by one, everybody else's life blew up. One of her friends in the group was murdered, another contracted HIV, and another developed severe mental health issues. One became a fundamentalist Christian, and another dropped out of the group when she realized how hard her life was going to be. So I'm the remaining survivor. If Anne had learned how to do one thing in her life, it was to survive. If she could do it long enough, she knew she would eventually live and thrive. And the next step was to get a job and live her life in her true gender. I got a job as Anne. It wasn't a great secret at my job because the computing community at that time was small enough that several people knew me. But for a long time, it was like not something it was okay to talk about. And I realized that that probably wasn't the best way to handle it. So I started talking about it a little myself. I'd make jokes and things, and you know, because I realized that that sort of turned down the tension among the people I was working with and what have you. But one person in the office wasn't comfortable with Anne. I got called in by uh, the company lawyer and HR, and they explained they had put a, a lock on the restroom, and if I went in there, I was supposed to lock the door because some of the women had complained. Specifically, it was one woman. I, I was That was fairly obvious. Oh, my God. This dirty tranny might be in the same bathroom as me and my pretty parts. Anne refused to use the lock, but said that the woman who'd complained was welcome to use it when she was in there. Shortly thereafter, several other women in the office complained about not being able to get into the bathroom, and the lock disappeared. After living as the woman she already knew she was for the next year, Anne was ready to seek out gender confirmation surgery. She looked around at all her options, including several university programs. I ended up talking to somebody in Omaha who had been to Biber. I, I asked around to friends in the community, you know, the, to be put in contact with somebody who'd been to Biber. Um, ended up being Franny, who I would end up having a relationship with. So the, the outcome of that is that I ended up having a having a nice relationship. By the time Ann Ogborn got in the car to make the drive across Kansas and southeastern Colorado to Trinidad, she'd survived the many stages of coming out. The shame, ridicule, and loneliness. But she also built a community, learned to love herself, and found the love of another person. The confirmation surgery that awaited her with Dr. Biber was just that, a confirmation of what she had always known and who she had always been. The obstacles that many trans people face in their daily lives can be difficult for cisgendered people to fathom. To cite just a few staggering statistics from the now decade-old National Transgender Discrimination Survey, 41% of trans people attempt suicide at some point in their lives, compared to 1.6% of the general population. 90% report some form of job discrimination, harassment, or mistreatment. And trans people are four times as likely to live in poverty. In a separate 2013 report from the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, it was found that 53% of LGBT homicide victims were transgender women. The majority of those were transgender women of color. And 40 to 50% of trans people experience family rejection of some kind. These incredibly grim statistics reveal not just a pervasive lack of acceptance and understanding on an interpersonal level, but on a societal and systemic level as well. Despite her hardships, Anne had some family support. Well, I should start by saying uh, that I went with my mother. She was pretty supportive, and we figured that out. From Kansas City, they drove back to her hometown of Salina and stayed the night. Then the next day, they drove through southwest Kansas along what was once the Santa Fe Trail, where the distance between gas stations can make your palms sweat. Across the border into Colorado, they stopped at Bent's Old Fort along the Arkansas River then drove south until the flat top of Fisher's Peak came into view just past the site of the Ludlow Massacre. They checked into the Derrick Motel at the edge of town, which has a 96-foot-tall oil derrick out front, 
and tried to rest before Anne's consultation with Dr. Biber the following day. As many had done before her, Anne made her way to Dr. Biber's strange old office at the top of the First National Bank building the following morning. I was very nervous about going to that, not because I was worried about whether I should do this or what have you. I, I was very clear about that. But it was the era of gatekeeping, and this guy had the ability to just turn me down. To this day, there are many gates that people who want gender confirmation surgery must pass through. And these gates are guarded by medical professionals, few of whom are trans themselves. There are the psychiatrists who evaluate your mental well-being, the endocrinologists who prescribe hormones, and the doctors, like Biber, who ultimately decide whether they think you're ready for the surgery. These protocols were first developed by Dr. Harry Benjamin and some of his colleagues in 1978 for those who wanted to get gender confirmation surgery. Eric Plemons says that these, quote, standards of care, however well-intentioned they might be from the perspective of the medical community, can also be seen as another form of gatekeeping. They're kind of guiding principles of how a person, uh, how a clinician should choose which types of, which people should be offered procedures and what the orders of those procedures should be. So you should start out with the psychological evaluation. You should have a certain number of months um, on cross-sex hormones. You should have to live a period of one year in the social role that you desire to live in, but it was called the real life test at the time. Um, and after that, you should get surgery. The protocol started out as two pages and have grown to over 180. They were important on one hand, because the healthcare and procedures for trans people simply weren't taught or regulated by medical schools or boards. And to this day, they still aren't. But the downside is that each medical professional along the way holds a huge amount of power over trans lives. This was true for Dr. Biber as well. Though his widow claims that he only turned away a small handful of his 6,000 patients over his career, he reserved that right for himself. And had that happened, I would be, you know, up crick without a paddle. So uh, I had, I had tizzed myself up. I'm not a, you know, I'm not overly into hair and makeup, but I sure was that day. I was very careful with my appearance. Which, uh, sadly, you know, that, that self-perpetuates the whole thing because this is what Biber then sees is one more trans woman who's been very careful with her appearance and then when somebody isn't, it, it sets off this is different flags. Eric Plemons says that having these various gatekeepers continues to create one of the great catch-22s of trans medicine. That very first iteration of the, the framework um, still is... A trans person has to have psychologists sign off on their ability to have a surgery, whereas that's not the case for any other elective surgery. Because by the very virtue of the fact of identifying yourself as trans, you mark yourself as not having the capacity to consent to your own care, right? Like you're, you are in that framework labeling yourself as having a mental incapacity. So you can't possibly then legally consent to the kind of thing that you want. Someone else has to say that you can do that. Biber signed off on Anne's surgery. Then she and her mom spent the rest of the afternoon playing tourist. As was the tradition among trans people who saw Dr. Biber, they bought a souvenir Trinidad brick like the many bricks stamped with the town's name that paved the streets, then went for dinner at the local Chinese restaurant. After that, they visited the shrine to San Rafael at the hospital, then got checked in for the procedure. The next morning, Dr. Biber performed what was by now, in 1988, a fairly routine procedure. And it went well. You know, the night before my surgery, I must confess, my mom sort of broke down and started talking about her own stuff. And at some point in the night, I had to say, you know, Mom, like, I'm getting bottom surgery tomorrow. I'm getting a sex change tomorrow. <laughs> like, maybe I, I'm not in the space to be doing this right now, you know? When I asked Anne how she felt after the surgery, she said, Like I had really bad gas? Like I was in pain? Honestly, for the most part, yeah, you know, there were no great philosophical thoughts. But the most uncomfortable part of the experience for Anne was when Dr. Biber came into the recovery room afterward. He said something weird when I was still, like, in the bed and hooked up to all kinds of tubes. At one point, they came in to basically undo all the tubes 
let me uh, get up. And he came in, he's wearing suspenders, he snapped his suspenders and said, well, I made it, I get to be the first to use it. Biber was apparently fond of this supposed joke. Anne was stunned. Look, I am currently 61. This all happened in my mid-20s. I've been living as a woman for a long time. And let me tell you, men behave badly sometimes. And and that's a really vulnerable place to be in. And, and men can behave really, really poorly in that situation. There's a, There still is a huge amount of sexism in the way trans women are treated during trans health care. Absolutely huge patronizing gobs of it. So that was the times, and that was that was where it was. Yeah, my mom was in the room. <laughs> so even Dr. Biber, so widely considered to be among the great allies to trans people, was unable to see his own sexism and paternalism, and the way it affected those he was helping. Despite her discomfort with Biber's tasteless remark, Anne remains grateful to him. The surgery, she says, was everything she hoped it would be done its job for a long time now. I certainly felt good about it. Susan Stryker says that none of the private doctors performing surgeries during that time were perfect, and that they were all a bit macho, if not sexist. But their arrogance, says Stryker, often came with the job, the convenience, and the reasonable cost. People had different different reactions to him, but, you know, he was, he was um, regarded as a, you know, as a reputable surgeon who was more accessible than the university-based clinics uh, where you didn't have to go to Thailand. Uh, You know, you could just, you know, you didn't have to get on an airplane. You could just, you know, hop in your car or get on the train and go to Trinidad. Eric Plemons invented a term for the often imperfect work that cisgendered white men like Stanley Biber and other private surgeons and healthcare workers have done for trans people for the past 50 years. He calls it restitutive or restitutive intimacy. So that this kind of intimacy that a doctor can convey to a patient that is a restitution for all of the other bullshit that they have to deal with in their lives. And you have trans folks who are legally discriminated against, um, whose surgical procedures are denied coverage from Medicare and Medicaid, and now Here is this person who is kind, who has a staff full of people who are understanding of them, who live in this little town that's completely embracing that they're coming there. So that was really a really big deal for a lot of people. The folks that I know who have had surgery um, from Biber say that he's he's a miracle worker. In other words, Stanley Biber was flawed. And the attitudes he revealed by making comments like the one mentioned a second ago can't be excused. And he also chose to use his abilities and his privilege for good, to serve those whom society wouldn't. In the end, one of Biber's greatest acts of restitutive intimacy was to hire and train a transgender surgeon to replace him. Just three years before he died, Stanley Biber invited an obstetric and gynecological surgeon named Marcy Bowers to come study under him in Trinidad. Bowers first met with Biber on May 25, 2000, the day USA Today ran a story about him on the cover. Basically, the headline was like small town doctor, you know, practicing sex change surgery. And there was like a, you know, imagine USA Today with like a one foot high picture of Dr. Biber uh, on the front, on the front page. I had come there with a couple of uh, psychologists from Seattle who had said, you really should meet this guy. He's a legend in the field of medicine. I had not had, you know, I was not a patient of his. Bowers vividly remembers being shocked when she walked into Biber's office for the first time. Stating linoleum and these worn out Naga hide chairs and it was just it was a it was really a sight. It looked like the inside of a bus depot, other than the fact that there was one of these medical insignias in the center of the floor that was all faded and you know, worn out. But they got along, and Biber was immediately impressed with Bowers while I was watching him operate, turned to me and said, you know, why don't you move to town and, uh, you know, bring your husband and and come on down and you can practice obstetrics and then learn the surgery from me. As we mentioned earlier, no medical schools taught gender confirmation surgical techniques or health care. In 2003, Bowers decided to take him up on the offer and move to Trinidad with her family. 
But the political climate of the early 2000s had changed significantly since Biber had started practicing in 1969. It was a great opportunity for both of them. For Bowers, it was a chance to study with one of the greats. For Biber, it was an opportunity to pass on his legacy. Having Stanley Biber quietly performing gender confirmation surgery at the local hospital was one thing, but having a transgender person performing those same surgeries in their town was another. Two hours to the north, in Colorado Springs, growing numbers of evangelical groups had organized vocal opposition to LGBT rights. When I moved to town, the hospital board decided not to tell anybody about my background of having been through the process. You know, it's a conservative town, and this is 2003, so they just thought, you know, people didn't really need to know. And, you know, in a way, I was grateful. You know, there's this passing privilege that people talk about. Plus, it just didn't matter, which I thought was a good tribute. As far as Bowers was concerned, she was in a unique position to give great care to everyone in the community. She wasn't there to be a trans representative. Then, almost as soon as Bowers had arrived, Biber lost his malpractice insurance due to his age. He was now 80 years old, and it would have cost him more than his annual income to replace it. Bowers remembers the moment. June 29, 2003, he turned to me and he handed me the knife, and you could have heard a pin drop all the way to Santa Fe. I mean, people literally, they gasped. They were like, because he had never done that before. It was eerie. But for as great a surgeon as Bowers was, she didn't have the same kind of relationship and history with the community that Stanley Biber did. She had come from Seattle, a big city, and had no interest in ranching or other more rural activities. She simply wasn't able to do the delicate high-wire act that Stanley Biber had managed. And she didn't have his cis-white male privilege or the long-term relationships with the community. As Mary Lee Biber put it, she was just too flashy. When Bowers bought a used convertible Porsche, people in town said she was flaunting. But for Bowers, their claims that she was too flashy or flaunting felt more like they were saying she was too trans. Then, about six months after she arrived, The Learning Channel came to town to shoot a documentary TV series called, quote, The Sex Change Capital of the World. Bowers saw it as a great opportunity to educate the public, but the town saw it as more flash and more flaunt. Bowers was not only out to the entire town at that point, but the town was out to the entire world. I think they were ashamed, actually. I can't be certain of that, but I think there was a certain element of it that they thought that was maybe a a bridge too far. They wouldn't actually bring somebody who was transgendered to the medical staff. Bowers says Biber was able to, quote, run interference for her until he died in 2006. But after that, she never quite found a way to fit into the town culture that had grown increasingly tired of its reputation. Still, she made a number of significant improvements to Dr. Biber's techniques during her time in Trinidad. But in 2010, she decided to move her practice to the Bay Area and ended Trinidad's 40-year service to the transgender community. Like many small Western towns, Trinidad has had to reinvent itself every so often. Before Biber and Bowers, there were the mines. After the mines, there was a brief period of mafia presence when Al Capone and his gang members hid out far from the eyes of Chicago law enforcement in the shadow of Fisher's Peak. The hippies came, then Biber and Bowers. And now Trinidad has undergone another transition. Here's Marcy Bowers. You know, now they got their marijuana and they always reinvent themselves. It's a very adaptive community. But for Marcy Bowers and the many people who love Stanley Biber, It's unfortunate that the town to which he gave so much of his life has nothing more than a gravestone to honor him. It's a shame that they're not willing to endorse his legacy. It's a cultural shift in the world, and it's going to be an indelible shift in how we think about gender and sexuality. Use his goodwill and trust within the community to go to a place that really people never imagined possible. Before Mary Lee Biber got cancer, she tried to get the city to name the street behind Mount San Rafael Hospital after her husband. For her, as a lifelong resident of Trinidad, it's the least the city could do for what he gave. His legacy to me was love, and I think the tolerance and understanding. Susan Stryker. For a generation of trans women, I mean, Stanley Biber was... He was one of the go-to guys. You know, he made a lot of people happy. Stryker says she'd like to see a monument to Biber right in the center of town next to the Miner's Memorial. There should be a giant vagina-shaped sculpture where he's standing there in front of it. 
with his arms crossed with a shitting grin on his face. Both Susan Stryker and Eric Plemons are happy that society is becoming more accepting of trans people and trans expression. Medical care has improved and expanded too. Though gender confirmation surgery is no longer available in Trinidad, it is available at various practices in places like Denver. The techniques for vaginoplasty or phalloplasty performed by doctors like Marcy Bowers and others around the world have improved dramatically. And there are so many other, much more expansive possibilities, like facial feminization surgery, says Eric Plemons. Now there's a much broader understanding of what a trans person might want from medicine and how you might deliver it. So it's possible now to say, I want to have top surgery but no bottom surgery, and have that be legible to clinicians, whereas in the 60s and 70s, that was nonsense. So they've moved from that sort of very rigid understanding of what kind of thing medicine might be for into a much broader and more open sense. Even if the town of Trinidad hasn't chosen to remember Stanley Biber, says Plemons, the trans community does. They may not know technically what he was up to, and they may not know his personal story, but they know the legacy of what he did. Even if it was to create one little town you know, that plays perfectly into the American sense of what the West is about, right? This sort of, you know, independent, a person who is the hero of his little town, who doesn't care what anyone else thinks, who wants people to have the personal freedom to do what they want, be what they want. That the idea, the sort of American fantasy that you can get in your car and drive out into the middle of nowhere and be who you want to be. And he and his practice helped to materialize that for a lot of people. And so, to me and my friends, he's very well known. <laughs> For Peter Bogue, people simply need to accept that the past, the present, and the future of the American West includes transgender people, their experiences, and their ideals of freedom, too. I mean, it sounds unusual, but that's also because of our stereotypes about what transgenderism or transsexuality or medical procedures and where medicine is most advanced and where these types of things should be taking place, Trinidad is part of this mythical West where these types of things just simply don't happen or they're assumed not to happen. So, you know, in that sense, Trinidad is like so much a part of the historic West that people just can't accept or they, it just is such a shock to them to find that the reality is really quite different from the mythology that's grown up around the place. Lost Highways is a production of History Colorado and History Colorado Studios. It's made possible by a generous grant from the Sturm Family Foundation with particular thanks to Stephen Sturm and Emily Sturm, and by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor. Again, if you've enjoyed this podcast and want to support it, please become a member of History Colorado. You can get 20% off your membership at historycolorado.org forward slash podcast discount. Plus, you get all kinds of great benefits like free admission to our eight museums around the state, where you can learn more about the stories we tell on Lost Highways. And you can get a subscription to the award-winning Colorado Magazine, which includes access to insightful articles and compelling perspectives on Colorado's past that we've published since 1923. And even if you don't become a member, you can still get $2 off admission to any of our museums just by mentioning the podcast. Special thanks to Susan Schulten, our history advisor on this episode, and to Chief Creative Officer Jason Hansen, Morgan Givens, and Mel Butler, our editors. Thanks to Lydia Smith for production help, and to Amanda Lane of History Colorado, as well as Noah Allen, Charlie Dreyer, and Mel Butler, who recently transcribed all our episodes. If you'd like to see the transcripts, either as a matter of accessibility or because you'd like to use Lost Highways in your classroom, you can find them at historycolorado.org forward slash lost dash highways. The music for this episode was by Earth Control Pill. Our theme is by Connor Bergal. Many thanks to our editorial team, Jason Hansen, Sam Bach, Sean Boyd, Brooke Garcia, Steve Grinstead, Kimberly Cronwall, Jose Ortega, Julie Peterson, Angel V. Hill, Marisa Volpe, and Zach Workowich. And to our advisory group, which includes Stephen Sturm, Emily Sturm, Jason Hansen, Thomas Andrews, Jonathan Futa, Charlie Woolley, Susan Schulten, Tom Romero, and Kara DeGette. Finally, thanks to the entire staff at History Colorado, I'm Noel Black. And I'm Tyler Hill. Thanks for listening.